The Dr. Fazzo TV Show is brought to you by POYA, People of Yuma Health Association. The Dr. Fazzo TV Show is intended for health educational purposes only and complies with all the HIPAA regulations. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our August 2020 edition of our show. We're here to further discuss the coronavirus, the COVID-19. Um, we are deep in the pandemic, so we are still practicing our social distancing. So we are not wearing our masks today because we are not in close proximity of every, of anybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Fazel, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for having me on this show today. And thank you, everybody, to, uh, uh, to uh, watch our show. Uh, so the topic of the discussion, as Wendy said, is uh, uh, what's next in, in pandemic of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, uh, are we out of the woods yet or, and what, are the, uh, what, what does the future look like? Uh, so Wendy, what is your, uh, do you have any question in mind so we can start the conversation? Yes, actually Dr. Fazel, um, what we are questioning is what is the new standard of care for this COVID-19 virus? Uh, so I think you're trying to ask what is the standard of care for the treatment or what is the standard of care for the diagnosis or what, uh, can you please explain your question a little bit more for me? Yes, what would the standard of care be for the current treatment for COVID-19? Um, so the, this uh, no published uh, standard of care for treatment of COVID-19 infection is this time. As a matter of fact, we do not have any um, consensus on, on the treatment of COVID-19 infection. Um, uh, I can tell you what I'm being doing is that we uh, only treat patients when they have symptoms. And uh, once we know patient is have COVID-19 and they have symptoms, uh, which could be, uh, you know, respiratory tract infection, like symptoms like cough, uh, runny nose, sometimes they have diarrhea, sometimes they have fever. Uh, also, they all present with uh, loss of uh, 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 smell uh, sensation as well as uh, taste sensation. So, and then if they have a high risk exposure to COVID-19 uh, uh, infection, then you, with the symptoms, you'll probably know that they have uh, active infection going on. So besides doing the quarantine for 15 days as suggested by CDC, um, uh, I would uh, also treat them with um, uh, steroids, which is prednisone, which is kind of equivalent to what dexamethasone is being used in hospitalized patients, as well as with, with z pack zinc, and hydroxychloroquine. I know that hydroxychloroquine is a kind of like more of a political um, um, dilemma at this time. I think between different versions of our political uh, sector uh, uh, is being looked upon as a taboo, I guess. But um, you know when you are have a very very sick patient in front of you we're gonna do what need to be done to save lives you know and in all patients set up at this point that's all we got and uh, obviously we do take precautions you know I know uh, 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 hydroxychloroquine can cause some connection uh, delays in the heart uh, that's why you do an EKG before you start uh, uh, using it and you probably not going to uh, use that in anybody who have underlying heart condition uh, especially the electrical connection um, defects uh, but uh, the benefit is more than any risks uh, there might be so uh, that's what I would uh, follow at this point um, there's some studies uh, which sp sports in favor of its use although they're not very big studies, but again, uh, we're gonna use what we need, uh, we, we have in our hand at this time in our patient setup. In patient setup, you have remdes uh, remdesivir, um, you have dexamethasone, we have um, um, plasma, uh, you know, the convalescent plasma uh, infusions, um, as well as, you know, if they're getting really short of breath, bring them on the ventilator, uh, but my, my my uh, suggestion is why wait that long where patient gets sick that enough 
to get to that level, why not treat them early enough and even prevent them the hospitalization because uh, more infection uh, and inflammation they get, difficult is going to be to treat them and uh, uh, that's, that, that's what my take is on this uh, epidemic at this point. Thank you so much. Dr. Fazel, in your clinical experience, have you had um, positive outcomes with that regimen that you were just discussing with the hydroxychloroquine? Yes, so in, uh, in uh, my clinical setup, in my clinical practice, uh, any patient who have a suspicion of having COVID-19 infection based on their exposure as well as symptoms, uh, I have seen a very good response so far. Um, none of my patients have actually got admitted to the hospital and uh, typically five to seven days of treatment have uh, have um, uh, make their symptoms go away and uh, I have a patient who was 70 years old uh, came to me he was uh, COVID-19 positive and obviously besides doing all the isolation and everything else uh, you still have to treat it because he was sick but not sick enough to go to send to the hospital uh, but he did have underlying uh, comorbid conditions like uh, you know asthma and COPD so I went ahead and treated him with uh, the regimen we know that might work and it did work and seven days later the, the patient was uh, almost jumping with the joy and he said he had no symptom at all and he was totally asymptomatic and uh, it was a uh, like a miracle thank you Dr. Fazza, we've seen a huge surge in positive cases throughout the United States. Is there anything that you can add to that or elaborate on to kind of explain why we're having so many positive cases? So that's a very uh, good question. So the fact of the matter is that uh, our healthcare system is driven on fee for service versus um, a lot of other uh, healthcare system in other countries, they are more of a social uh, medicine. Uh, that means this uh, some part uh, more tests is being done than other other countries because uh, the labs get paid pretty heavily by insurance companies. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, obviously uh, the more tests you do, uh, the more cases you're going to get. And also I have seen that uh, if the patient is tested twice, uh, for example, he got tested one time uh, and, and then I, uh, two weeks later he wanted to test again to see if, if he has recovered and if he's still positive, that is being counted two cases. So the data is skewed and uh, uh, we can, um, I think that's a, one of the reasons that we are seeing a, such a, a huge um, uh, like a spike, unusual spike in uh, United States as compared to other countries. Uh, and, and I have seen, I know that a lot of countries not even checking it anymore. They wouldn't even check it unless they think that you need to go on the ventilator. So now they don't even have a data. Well, if you don't have a data, if you don't you check it, then it seems like they got a plateau in their cases, which is not true. And I know some of the countries are doing it for financial reasons because they want to make their countries look better. And then there's United States because that's uh, going to help their tourism business and everything. So uh, I think uh, uh, we have a disadvantage uh, by giving the true numbers in one way, which is the right thing to do, but also it makes uh, the numbers look bad. And also we have a lot of false positive cases as well. And um, what I would suggest is if you want to really look at the uh, real numbers, uh, from the other countries versus our country, the United States, then look at the mortality rate. Our mortality rate is very low as compared to a lot of other countries, uh, developed or, uh, or underdeveloped countries. And uh, if you look at the data of the death rate, you know, the, the death rate is pretty high. But then the death rate from other countries, you don't know if they die of uh, COVID-19 infection or something else uh, because they got never tested for that. So the whole of, it's a comparison between apple to oranges. So what we're doing is we're doing more, uh, but then we're also getting nailed for that as well. So I think that's where the problem is. Uh, too much testing, 
uh, data which is defined differently than what the conventional wisdom will tell us to do, how to define the test and uh, that is like making our case look way too high. So Dr. Fazo, where can the average person look to for accurate information and instructions? There's so uh, much there's so much information out there and it's sometimes it's controversial as far as how accurate or inaccurate the information may be. So um, for the information, obviously the internet has a lot of misinformation. Uh, there's a few uh, places that the consumer can go and look at uh, like CDC website for guidelines as well as they can ask their primary care doctors uh, which are pretty uh, well aware of the new uh, development of COVID-19 infection. So I would rely on those two uh, places, at least for now. We'll see in the future, but uh, that's uh, uh, more likely you're going to give uh, uh, real information, unbiased real information. Okay. And if a patient tests positive for COVID-19 and is unable to work, if their symptoms have passed and they are no longer showing symptoms, how soon can they return to work? We are in uncharted territory at this time. Um, if you look at the published guidelines, they say you know, you know, if you if you've been uh, uh, quarantined for 15 days after you get positive, and you have no symptoms, you don't need to be. Uh, uh, you probably can go back to the work. Um, but in a high risk profession, for example, the healthcare sector, where they're exposed to uh, patients which have uh, more comorbid conditions my recommendation would be to uh, test them again and make sure they are uh, they, have, they are not still having a, a positive infection because they can spread to the patients so again um, that's my view uh, and we'll see if it changes because we don't have enough data to say yay or nay on this uh, question at this time so i will go with you know conventional wisdom is to uh, check and if they got immunity, uh, then they should be good to go. But if they have uh, active infection, they should should still avoid uh, contact with uh, uh, sick patients so they don't get infection from them. Okay. And where does that leave an employee who is not feeling sick but is still testing positive or has to wait several weeks for a, a test results to come back? Where does that leave them as far as how do they support themselves and, and gain an income because they are still technically employed but they're not able to work and they're not able to collect a paycheck? And that's uh, questions uh, for the legislators. Uh, somewhere they have to come up with some kind of um, uh, a law that will uh, that a government should fund or there should be a stimulus package or some kind of system where those employees which are uh, are not laid off but they got infection and then uh, they are, are unable to work uh, because of positive infection but they have no symptoms at this time but they still have positive tests you know then uh, we don't know how long they're going to stay positive uh, because everybody have different immune response then uh, I do understand that they have to have some source of income because they cannot apply for unemployment and uh, they cannot get a stimulus check at the same time, then there should be a third option. Uh, I think that's up to the legislator that they should look into that also, uh, that portion of the uh, uh, employees which are in that uh, undefined category. Okay. And Dr. Fazel, if a if an employee has tested positive or if a patient has tested positive and need a, needs a follow-up test, what is the best test to do? Would that be the nasal swab or the blood test? So uh, I would recommend the blood test because what the blood test will tell you is uh, what kind of antibody response you have. Now if you have IgG antibody uh, for COVID-19 and IgM is negative, IgM is the one which is indication of active infection versus IgG's uh, indication of uh, um, uh, immunity, then you, uh, the physician or the providers have a better understanding 
of the situations. So I will recommend the blood test instead of nasal swab to see if they are uh, uh, able to come back or not. But what, there's one caveat though. I have seen uh, uh, the reports from the labs where the patient have IgG antibody level positive and they're writing the interpretation as a positive test. That's actually very misleading. It should be, it should say a patient is immune to the test. Uh, it should say the patient is immune to the virus and not have a active infection that because they only got IgG antibody levels positive. So, the, so they shouldn't be, uh, 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 the interpretation should say uh, immune immunity to COVID-19 infection. I'm not saying the test is positive because that's causing a lot of panic. Uh, panic uh, situation in the community. And I think that's another reason we have so much positive cases because even IgG test positive is being tested, reported as positive test. It should be reported as immune to COVID-19. So that's your another reason that we have so much uh, positivity in, uh, in, in, in test uh, results in, 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 uh, in the United States. Dr. Fazel, how long are the antibodies present in the blood system? So after the infection, what we have seen in some of the cases that the antibodies start to taper off after after 90 days. So it's very uh, it's uh, it's very scary because uh, uh, unlike a lot of other infections where the immunity at least lasts for a year or more, sometimes lifelong, it is not lasting that long. Uh, so uh, that's why the herd immunity has probably less role in prevention of this pandemic because your immunity is not forever. It tapered off rapidly, and we have seen that people who got COVID-19 infection one time, they're also getting it the second time, especially after 90 days when they have uh, lost immunity. And we're also seeing that this virus is muting, mutating fast, just like an HIV virus. Uh, so, um, um, and the same thing happens in HIV, that you find a treatment, then you try to fix it, and by the time you got the treatment, it has already mutated, and that treatment is no more effective. Um, so that's one of the problem we are um, have to face with this super bug. I will call it super bug, uh, which is uh, very very strange and is rapidly uh, evolving. So it's always one step ahead of healthcare workers and healthcare industry and all the intervention we are trying to uh, put in place. So it is like um, like a super bug and. We're still trying to understand like how to handle this virus and um, we'll see what happens in the future, you know. Okay. What determines the length of time that the antibodies are remain present in the bloodstream? Is it the severity of the virus? Is it the severity of the case that the, the patient has or what exactly does determine that? Um, we don't know that. We don't know uh, at, at this point. We don't have enough data to answer this question. So. I think on that note, also I would say uh, the role of vaccine because most vaccines are designed that uh, you uh, give a, a immune response to the uh, you give a um, you like you have either a, uh, a virus antigen or uh, or attenuated virus uh, or like a weak virus to the patient or like a live weak virus to the patient so they can develop the antibody response to that virus. And they can, uh, so they have immunity and antibodies. So when they get real infection, they don't get sick or they don't get infection at all. Uh, but what we're seeing now that when even when they get real infection, the immunity doesn't last more than 90 days. Uh, so the question is how the vaccine is going to cause that protection uh, if the immunity only lasts for 90 days. So that's one question we have to answer. And the second question is. Um, if it's also mutating so fast, then um, the virus will mutate by the time we have vaccine for one strain, what we're gonna do for the second strain and third strain. And we also have noticed that, unlike the previous prediction that this infection will not be that bad in the summer, how come it's more worse in summer than, uh, than the winter? And I mean, as we know, like flu virus and a lot of cold viruses, they only become, uh, uh, um, prevalent in the in the winter time, like like for example, a flu virus, it become prevalent from October till November, or I'm sorry, October till um, April each year. So, 
how come this virus is still there in the extreme heat of summer? So that means that uh, this is a, a, a year-long uh, epidemic. It has no seasonal variation. Uh, that's also very uh, concerning as well. Okay. So we're going to wrap it up with the million-dollar question, Dr. Fossil. Should we continue testing? Should we back off of our testing? Or should we increase our testing? So I will call it a billion dollar question. Uh, uh, and the, the reason is like, any test we do, we do it for a reason. Unless we're doing a, an epidemiological study. Otherwise, uh, from intervention point of view, if we do a test and there's no follow up, there's no treatment, then we're just wasting our, our money. For example, uh, if, if we do the test, the results should be available rather quickly so we can do the intervention, for example, quarantine the patient if it's positive. The test has to be have a rather good uh, true positive rates, less false negative, less false positive rates. And then in addition, we should also be having, uh, be able to do contact tracing so uh, so we can prevent the, this epidemic to, uh, from more spreading. Now, uh, what we have seen so far, that's not happening. You do the test, sometimes take it weeks to come back, sometimes it's come back weeks after it's false positive, false negative, and then there's no follow-up after that test is being done. Patients have no clue what to do next after the test is given to them weeks after they've been tested. So um, in realistic world that should be should have been done the results should have been available immediately. Uh, they should have been quarantined if it's positive, it should be real positive and then there should be a mechanism in place to see who the guard contacted in the last 14 days so they can do the contact contact tracing and and test them and if they're positive they should be isolated as well. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, that is not happening. That means we're doing the test, uh, which are a lot of time is false positives, and then the data is also skewed because if the patient is tested twice, uh, it is um, reported as two cases instead of one cases. And then also, if you do a blood test and it has immunity uh, to the COVID-19 because they got exposed, but they get recovered and then have immunity, they are also being reported as positive. So. Uh, I think it's causing more of a fear factor uh, than doing any real uh, good at this time. I would uh, focus on the testing uh, and I will say do more testing only when you have the plan in place. Let's say what you're going to do next after the test was positive or negative, which would be either you treat the patient or you do, uh, um, you know, iso uh, quarantine the patient and then do the contact tracing. And if we cannot do all these three things, then we should only do the testing when patient has imminent uh, respiratory failure. I don't see any need, uh, medical uh, necessity for doing testing uh, for heck of it, you know. So I think uh, we should wait for the test to develop, wait for the treatment to be, become available, and wait for the vaccine to be available. So instead of using our resources in testing, testing and testing and not doing everything afterwards everything and just making numbers and causing lockdowns and financial shutdowns I think we should focus on finding the treatment and then finding the um, right vaccination and then uh, and then after that yeah testing will make more sense but right now I don't think uh, putting a lot of focus on testing is doing any, any good to us in any way. Uh, we do know it spreads uh, mostly through respiratory modes. Yes, yeah, social isolation is still recommended and use a mask. I think we should focus more more on those two things and then just wait when you get the vaccination available and uh, treatment available and then and the test become more accurate and uh, rapid response available, then, then go ahead and do start doing more testing. But at this point, I think it's causing more of a fear factor than doing any good to us, to our communities, or to our, to our economy. 
that concludes, or this concludes our August 2020 edition. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Fazel, for joining us as well. Thank you so much, uh, for Bernie, for having me in the show today, and thank you, our audience. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be back next month uh, with more updates. So stay, stay healthy and stay safe.